And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the, the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Willistiquaic, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s, and we're grateful for the peaceful use of this land. I am very pleased to welcome you to our 17th annual Dalton Camp Lecture in Journalism. Every year, our students, our university community, and the people of Fredericton look forward to this event. And when we launched this lecture series, we set our sights high. We wanted to attract the best journalists to St. Thomas in honor of Dalton Camp, a great New Brunswicker, a great Canadian, and a world-class journalist. At the same time, we wanted to connect our students to the leading reporters of the day. This lecture is funded by the Dalton Camp Endowment, a $1 million endowment that pays for special activities in our journalism program. From this endowment, we are able to sponsor student activities, to bring journalists to campus to work with their students, and to organize professional development workshops. The Dalton Camp Endowment helps us to educate highly qualified young journalists each year. Thanks to our professors, Philip Lee, Michael Camp, and Jan Wong, who all, I think they're all here with us this evening. These two grads have gone on to work in every corner of the country and have won international recognition for their work. Our camp lecture speakers have been nationally and internationally renowned. And I'd like to mention, as Mary did, just a few names uh, to remind you of some of the most successful lectures. Our lectures have included June Colwood, Naomi Klein, Chantal Hebert, David Carr, Lise Doucette, and Mohammed Fahmy, and many others. And I believe that tonight's message and tonight's messenger, timely, independent, probing, and forceful, will again inspire our students and all of you who are present this evening. Emily Bell is a columnist and professor of professional practice at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. She is the founding director of the Columbia Tau Center for Digital Journalism, which is internationally recognized for its research into the intersection of journalism and technology. She also serves as a member of the Columbia Journalism Review's Board of Overseers and has served as chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Advisory Council on Social Media. Bell's career as an award-winning journalist with, began with Big Farm Weekly in 1987. In 1990, she joined The Observer as a business reporter and was later named business editor. The majority of her career was spent at Guardian News and Media in London. And as editor-in-chief editor across the Guardian websites and director of digital content for Guardian News and Media, Bell led the, the team in pioneering live blogging, multimedia formats, data and social media, and made The Guardian a recognized pioneer in the field. Bell is co-author of Post-Industrial Journalism, Adapting to the Present, and co-editor of Journalism After Snowden, The Future of the Free Press in the Surveillance State. She delivered the Reuters Memorial Lecture in 2014, the U. Cudlip Lecture in 2015, and she was the 2016 Humanities Visiting Professor in Media at the University of Cambridge. And tonight, she's delivering for us the Dalton Camp Lecture in Journalism. I'd ask you all please to welcome Emily Bell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam President. I'm just getting used to saying Madam President, because who knows, one day. Um, and I have to say, when you get to my age, it's um, incredibly, I'm just always incredibly grateful that somebody will stand up and remind me of everything that I may have done, because honestly, I can't remember whether I did it or not. Um, but it's, it's, it's all written down. Uh, and thanks very much indeed, Mary Link. Um, it's such a pleasure to um, be here. Uh, serving as it were kind of the institution of, um, educa of journalism education but also of public media as well and a lot of that is what I'm going to be right, uh, talking about tonight. How many of you here are journalism students? Fantastic. So I want to say to you thank you 
because I believe you are, and I want to say congratulations, because you are entering exactly the right field at exactly the right time. Um, and I'm going to explain why. It may not always feel that way, uh, but I genuinely believe that you could not be uh, entering a better profession. Um, it's great to be giving this lecture in uh, what is Press Freedom Week, and my goodness, what a week we've had. Um, you may have noticed that I am British, which means that um, Canada is very much my favorite European country. Um, <laughs> But if you are interested in how uh, democracy should function um, and how you're interested, and if you're interested in the rule of law being upheld and how constitutional process can keep power in check, then this has been so far a good week. Uh, we have the President of the United States now in impeachment proceedings and in Britain. Uh, we've been told by our own Supreme Court that the Prime Minister acted illegally. Uh, and indeed lied to the Queen, which is still, believe it or not, quite a big deal. Um, I wouldn't want to be the person who lied to the Queen. She has quite a frosty glare. Um, I'm going to say a few gloomy things this evening. So I want to start, before, before we go to the bad place, I want to start in the good place. Um, journalism is an incredible field to work in. It is a total privilege. It's, I, sometimes I wake up, I cannot believe my luck. I know that sounds... I don't sometimes, sometimes I wake up, it has to be said at 5 a.m. with a 10 a.m. deadline, um, and then I don't feel like it's an enormous privilege. But all the rest of the time, I feel like it's an enormous privilege. And to be able to tell stories that make a difference to people's lives is really quite something. Um, Without journalism, this is something that you must, you know, I want you students to think about, I want everybody here to think about, which is what happens in a world without, without journalism. Without journalism, um, we really wouldn't know many of the things that we know today. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein would still be walking around. We wouldn't know that the Russians had interfered with the 2016 election. Elizabeth Holmes would still be a chief executive of Theranos. Um, you know, we wouldn't have the Me Too movement. Like, all of these things really were uncovered by the hard work of investigative journalists. We wouldn't know that the opioid crisis had really been spread by the um, actions of uh, the companies that, that, that pushed and the doctors that prescribed. It's, I, it's really hard to think of any story or any scandal which has not been brought forward by the hard work of journalists. Um, every year, when we have an intake of journalism students at Columbia, um, I, do an I, do, I do a beginning of term lecture, and I get lots of questions at the end of it. And I've noticed how the questions have changed. They've changed from, how do I get a job at the New York Times, or CBC, or the BBC? Uh, how much am I going to earn? <laughs> Occasionally, you know, how do I get on TV? Um, I, really want to, I really want to read the news, less and less of that. Um, we still get questions, but we now get big questions. Is journalism going to be okay? Can I, can I make a career doing this? Uh, and can I be safe? Um, and how can I see, keep myself safe is really what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Because I can't give certain answers to those questions now. I can't give those answers with the certainty that I would like. And it's vitally important to, to democracy that we can give positive answers to, yes, journalism is going to be OK. Yes, you will be able to make a living at it. And yes, you'll be able to keep yourself safe. If journalism is so effective, why is it in so much trouble? Why do newspapers keep closing? Why does the President of the United States call us all fake news, enemies of the people? And why do we read and hear so many things about the crisis in journalism? Firstly, journalism, I do believe, really does work. But there are many things about it that are broken. The business model is broken. The publishing environment is broken. The public's belief in the reporting process and in journalism, unfortunately, is broken. And even you might argue that the democracy that we are meant to be a part of, the functioning of that, too, is a little bit broken. But I do believe um, I'm a pessimist by nature, uh, which is a great... Journalism is a great profession, if you are a pessimist by nature. 
Um, but I'm curiously optimistic at the moment because I believe that the moment that we're in, which is one of crisis, um, means that we've actually been forced to confront some ways in which we can change and uh, fix things. Um, but I do believe that to fix journalism, to fix those problems I've just listed, we have to think in a very radical way. We have to put the kind of energy that we've put into making money into fixing our civics. So I think we need to think about journalism uh, as part of a basic human right, as part of a civic service, um, and we need to be really committed, all of us, to nurturing new standards and practices in journalism. Um, and where the commercial pocket market plays a part, uh, I think it will continue to play a part, but I don't think it continued, can continue to be the dominant part. I think we have to shift to a system of journalism where business very much comes second, or profit comes second, and mission comes first. One of the problems I think that journalism is suffering from at the moment um, is actually simply by being effective, it's endangering itself. Uh, the impact makes it a dangerous profession. People don't really want you to do your job effectively, as um, Bob Woodward uh, says, or says that he says every time he got up in the morning as a, a reporter, what are the bastards trying to hide from me today? <laughs> when I started my career in 1987 on Big Farm Weekly, which I have to tell you, for those of you who are journalism students, if you get offered a job by a an outlet which sounds slightly less glamorous than the jobs that your colleagues at your, your class are getting, take them. My friends from university were boasting about the internships that they had at Vogue uh, and then spent six months making tea uh, and being shouted at by Meryl Streep or whoever it was. Um, I went to Big Farm Weekly and I went to interview ministers, I stood in freezing fields, I covered mad cow disease. I, it was literally the most wonderful introduction to journalism. So I'm not um, embarrassed about my trade roots in agriculture. In fact, I'm very proud of them. And it protected me. Um, I was protected as a journalist. Um, I was protected from my own foolishness by an in-house training scheme and by three or four editors on every piece I, I, I wrote, even on a small agricultural trade paper. I was protected from litigation by libel lawyers and insurance. I was protected by uncertainty in employment by a contract and a regular salary. I was protected from the wrath of readers. We didn't actually hear many of those. We did once get the name of somebody's pig wrong, who did get quite annoyed and rang us up. But it was not, it was something we could very easily smooth over with a phone call and correction. Um, the fact that feedback, both good and bad, arrived by phone call or letter, uh, we never felt threatened or in danger. The worst thing to ever happen to me was the wheel fell off my car. Um, when I was on my way to, the to, to cover a story. Um, and later in my career at The Guardian, uh, by which time journalists didn't get cars with their jobs, um, I was protected by the machinery of a great institution that was designed and funded to help people only focus on journalism and standing up to power. We had the great good luck of a business model that came from an endowment uh, which didn't require us to be profitable uh, and which had been set up by C.P. Scott. It meant that the Guardian, we weren't as lavish as some of our rivals. Um, we weren't as lavish. We didn't have, as they had at News International, enormous escalators with a bust of Rupert Murdoch at the top and fountains in the lobby. Always, if you're a business reporter, always watch out for fountains in the lobby. It's a bad sign. Um, <laughs> Apologies to anyone who has a fountain in their lobby. I'm sure it's fine. Um, we, weren't, uh, we were not as profitable. We didn't have the bonuses and the big salaries. Um, but we were really able to experiment in things like digital development. Our focus was always, always on journalism first. Uh, and we focused on journalism that we really believed was in the public interest, even if it took us months, or in some cases years, to dig the stories out. As a, as a media business reporter at the time, how many people here are watching Succession? 
Okay, so I'll address my remarks to you two then. Um, <laughs> my, my life was very much like, uh, the, like Succession. Please watch it. It's not really a drama. It's actually a documentary. Um, so I had, to re I had to report on all the other media companies. And when I interviewed the owners or chief executives, uh, they would scoff at The Guardian. They would say, putting people from editorial in charge is crazy. You've made a company that you fashioned to hang around the editor's shoulders as a mantle? That's absurd. You don't have a business model, they would say. Well, some of those people, the ones who are not in jail, um, or who have not, and some of them have been in jail. Uh, you may know some of them. Um, I'm happy to say that the Guardian's business model is thriving, uh, and their business model has not fared so well. And I would argue that actually it was their business model that was a risk for journalism, because hyper-commercialism in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s really put journalism at risk. The self-inflicted wounds of journalism, ironically, I think, happened during the time when the media economy was really booming. For years, the protections offered that we enjoyed by the wealth and power of newsrooms also infected them quite often with corruption, with sensationalism, and sometimes, in the case of the phone hacking scandal that The Guardian uncovered, uh, activities that were just plain illegal. If there's a lack of trust in journalism and unwillingness to believe journalism is necessary by the general public, then at least some of this, not all of it, but at least some of it has been authored by the misuse of power um, by elements of the corporate media. And it's always difficult to say that because we are always told those companies invested in journalism. Sometimes I say, well, they did, but we're not quite sure at what cost. And sometimes I think that cost was too high. I think this is why we need to think about mission rather than profit. This does not mean we don't have to really work on our business models. Non-profit is a business model. Public media is a business model. Um, but it is more important that we protect the mission. Even in the relatively safe havens of North America and Western Europe, well-paying jobs that carry the benefits, training, legal coverage, and layers of editing are nowadays the very rare exception and not the rule, as they were when I started. The daily pressure, as well, of a job that never stops is played out against the background of a much larger existential threat to journalism. Uh, and the number of um, students who I t taught 10 years ago when I first entered the field of teaching at Columbia, who come back now and say, this is an exhausting business, when is it gonna get better, is startling. The Committee to Protect Journalists reported that 2018 was one of the most deadly years for journalists across the world. Of the 53 journalists who were killed in their line of work, the majority, 34, were singled out and killed as a reprisal for the work that they had done. It's really important to think about that because before, it would have been very common for journalists just to be killed in conflict. Now they're being targeted um, and picked off for the work that they've been doing. Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Palestine, all saw numbers of journalists killed. But shockingly, it was not just war-torn countries or countries with notoriously dangerous conflicts or with poor records of press freedom where we've, where we've seen the threats to journalism rise. It's happening in countries supposedly safe for journalists that have traditionally protected press freedom. Four journalists, as we know, were murdered in their newsroom in the capital gazette in Annapolis. In Europe, Maltese journalist Daphne uh, Carauna Galizia was blown up in her car after investigations that upset the authorities. Investigative journalists have been murdered in Slovakia and Bulgaria. And of course, we've got the shocking example of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, tortured and murdered in the South of Medi Medi South tortured and murdered in the Saudi Arabian embassy in Turkey. America, a country that in the past used moral authority and economic pressure on the regimes that torture journalists, are now contributing to the problem. The US president went 
when presented with evidence that Saudi leader Mohammed bin Salman had authorized Khashoggi's killing, just said, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Only this week, the publisher of the New York Times, Arthur Greg Salzberger, wrote an editorial about the attacks on journalism. In, him, in it, he made a horrifying disclosure. This is what he wrote. Two years ago, he said, we got a call from a United States government official warning us of the imminent arrest of a New York Times reporter based in Egypt, Declan Walsh. Declan's a great reporter. I used to work with him at The Guardian. Though the news was alarming, the call was actually pretty standard. Over the years, we've received countless such warnings from American diplomats, military leaders, and national security officials. But this particular call took a surprising and distressing turn. We at the New York Times learned that the official was passing along this warning without the knowledge or the permission of the Trump administration. Rather than trying to stop the Egyptian government or assist the reporter, the official believed the Trump administration intended to sit on the information and let the arrest be carried out. The official feared being punished for even alerting us to the danger. The number of journalists in jail has soared to an all-time high. And at a time when technology is actually making many dangerous fields safer, whether it's in firefighting, police work, the armed forces, it's ironically making journalism far more deadly. In Brazil, the Philippines, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Hungary, India, and an increasing number of other countries. We now have leaders who openly undermine and criticize the press, who at best turn a blind eye to the violence towards journalists, and the worst, author it themselves. Almost unbelievably, we have to add America to that list. Violent language matters. It sets a tone. Anyone of you who's familiar with uh, world history will know what the authoritarian playbook is. Invert the truth, discredit the press. Violent language puts pressure on journalists. Online pressure and harassment is a pernicious and often invidious attack on journalism. Just recently, uh, actually, um, a Canadian, uh, Lucy Westcott, uh, surveyed women, for the C women journalists for the CPJ in Canada and America. Uh, and it showed that persistent online harassment and trolling is making female journalists feel less safe. 85% of respondents believed uh, that journalism had become less safe in the last five years. Online harassment was cited as the biggest threat. 90% of female journalists in the US cited it as a threat, 70% in Canada. Journalists across a range of beats received threats, but the harassment was more severe and sustained for those covering local or national politics or extremism. For vulnerable journalists who might be a target because of gender, sexuality, religious orientation, ethnic background, this harassment is particularly intense and the damage, therefore, great. We are desperately in need of journalists from all backgrounds, and yet there is inadequate protection for the few diverse, diverse voices that we do have. I've noticed, just working as a professor in a J school, the rising number of young women journalists, young black journalists, who don't want to be online public figures, who censor themselves. It no longer feels worth the meager paycheck to have aggressive and threatening messages in your inbox every morning. Much of this has been created by a complex system of speech designed for us by Silicon Valley. The rise of technology platforms against gatekeepers of our news and information channels has made things both simultaneously better for journalists and worse. It's broken the monopoly on production and distribution. It's made it possible for anybody to be published as a voice. And in certain parts of the world, this cannot be underestimated as an enormous change for good. But the founders of Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google, created enormous opportunities for human self-expression, but they did so without really adequately thinking at all about safeguards. It was negligent in the extreme. They, the fact was that they thought they were designing technologies that would improve the free speech commons, but in fact, 
they did exactly the opposite. What they designed undermined the free speech commons. The fact is their success destroyed the advertising subsidy model for news. Their algorithmic distribution favours cheap and sensational content over important and the tide of malicious and dangerously misleading content on the platforms is only kept at bay by a large number of poorly paid and hastily trained moderators. If you'd actually set out to design machines that would stealthily undermine democratic integrity, you really couldn't have done a better job. And yet, these companies seem to have been taken completely by surprise. Google, which owns YouTube and, face and Facebook, which owns WhatsApp and Instagram, they are the most successful advertising companies in history. And most of their revenue has come from legacy media. By aggregating the huge amounts of data from activities on their platforms, they can target ads with just great precision at very low cost. But systems of data aggregation and advertising do not care whether somebody has painstakingly reported a story for their about their local council. The algorithm doesn't know if a reporter has been doggedly following a story for 10 years or whether it's a cheap ag aggregation of somebody else's work. Now, even the platforms finally have woken up to what a disaster this has been, and they are hastily trying to repair the damage with initiatives to elevate original reporting. A welcome move, but it's two decades too late. As the Canadian BuzzFeed journalist Craig Silverman, who's one of my heroes, discovered in 2016, it was far more profitable for fake news manufacturers to make real money out of uh, false material created in their bedrooms than it was for a newsroom to monetize their own reporting. If you regularly, rep if you regularly manufactured fake material, you could easily make $10,000 a month in advertising if your material was sufficiently viral. You can buy an awful lot of pizza for $10,000 a month, but you cannot run a newsroom. In 2016, the presidential election in the United States showed us exactly what was possible on the loosely guarded Facebook platform and across the Twitter network and on YouTube servers. A breezy disregard for the responsibilities of publishing have brought many parts of the world to a point of democratic crisis. In America, we have polarizing language and difficulty with the truth. We now know the Russian government agencies used US advertising technology to interfere with the election. And we have the effects of violent language and themes coming from the internet and into real life in the form of mass shootings, stochastic terrorism, uh, and domestic violence. In places like New Zealand and elsewhere, we've witnessed the devastating effects of extremist rhetoric. And in the most shocking case of all in Myanmar, we saw how Facebook services in the region bore a direct responsibility for stirring up both racial division and causing genocide. Since the introduction of the share button on Facebook, which was in 2009, the spread of misinformation has absolutely rocketed. Fact checkers told me that since 2010, an increasing amount of their work has been to debunk misinformation rather than keep lying politicians in check, although that apparently is on the rise too. The collapse of advertising and legacy media has cost many towns across several continents, their local news and even their local online newsrooms, which were meant to be able to withstand uh, the decline of print. In Canada, the overall number of journalists has dropped by 7% in the last 15 years. Might not sound like that much, 7%, that's not bad. Uh, but after taking into account the growth of the overall workforce, the percentage of Canadians working as journalists has declined by 20%. In America, across all newsrooms, our employment is down by 25% in the last decade. And in the newsroom staff of newspaper companies in particular, the last decade has seen employment drop by half. So we've lost 50% of our reporters and editors in newsroom. That reporting resource didn't just fill newspapers, it provided the lead for television and radio shows as well. Um, in the meantime, things which make journalism really hard... Uh, apologies to anyone who's taking the public relations course in here. Um, things that make journalism really hard are growing exponentially. So let's compare the numbers of journalists at the moment working in the United States, about 49,000, nearly 50,000, with an average salary of $43,000 a year. Uh, that number's expected to decline by 5,000 or so in the next 10 years. But for public relations specialists, there are currently 270,000 PR specialists working for an average salary of 60,000. Please, journalism students, don't 
think about changing profession. <laughs> and the field is expected to grow by 6% or another 17,000 jobs in the next 10 years. So spin is outpacing journalism at a ratio of 6 to 1, a gap that's only going to grow. The sheer weight of PR alone is enough to smother journalism alive. Thanks to the ease of publishing through social platforms, political communications operatives and PR specialists are, of course, bypassing the press and creating their own media. The inevitable future of journalism is going to be a very thin layer of reporting and analysis amid a huge growing swamp of everything we might call content. You know that local news website that popped up that just carries a lot about housing and shopping? It's a PR exercise. That news site on Facebook that says it's here to report on policy making, it's backed by a hyper-partisan political pack. The local paper that covers the power plant, it's owned by the power plant. I'm not making any of those examples up, incidentally. That's true. They all exist. We can count the number of reductions in news newsroom headcounts, but now it'll take us much longer, I think, to actually appreciate all the other ways in which journalism's core mission is being eroded. There's never been a time in news consumption history before when we can receive so many pieces of information and so many messages and know so little about how they got here and why we're reading them and if they're true. And this is about to increase in a way that we cannot possibly imagine. Art I, I told you this was going to a bad place, I do apologise. Um, Artificial intelligence offers amazing opportunities for newsrooms to target people with personal news, to alter stories and experiences for audiences they are reading or watching. Automated stories can be generated from every source of data. It will really be a great opportunity for newsrooms, and it will leave journalists free to do much more reporting. But these are, un these are mostly coming from privately owned, unaudited, and unaccountable technologies. Uh, we, already, we already live in a world where an, in, an artificial intelligence script, natural language processing, makes it um, perfectly possible for surveillance uh, footage to be, say, taken from a camera mounted on a doorbell uh, and to write a story in real time about whoever is walking past your house and what they're doing. Yes, this actually exists. It's sold by Amazon. It's called Ring. And a few months ago, Ring advertised for a news editor. So a doorbell and its data feed wants a news editor to be able to synthesize these feeds into stories owned by Amazon. We know computers can already produce lifelike videos, deep fakes, cheap fakes, which blur the line between the real and unreal, audio fakes as well. Uh, and soon we'll have a cut version of that technology which can replicate this room, all of us in it, my voice in real time, that says something completely different from what you're hearing. We know facial recognition is already extensively used for social control and repression in China, and it will be inevitably used as well to curb press freedoms. A report out today from the Oxford Internet Institute put together a list of 70 countries where governments are actively involved in disinformation campaigns, from hiring influencers to spread messages and comment on social media to boost their signals, to activating troll networks to discredit and silence opponents and the press. The line of defense we have against this onslaught of misinformation is essentially journalism. Journalists are exceptionally good at pointing out problems, but less good at thinking, about, thinking up solutions. Uh, so the good news, if there is any, in, the, in this crisis, and I think that, that, that this is a crisis, it's pushed us into what Paul Starr, who's a sociologist and media theorist, uh, calls a constitutive moment. It's a time when the rules change so dramatically that to make any progress or save what's valuable, we're forced to make constitutive choices. In Europe, in the, second world, in the wake of the Second World War, for instance, many extraordinary institutions and even new countries were created at one such moment. Public service broadcasting was, in large part in Europe, one manifestation of this new institution building. Here is our constitutive moment for journalism. We need to protect the freedom of expression. We need to create a right to hear for citizens. We need reliable information as a human right. 
We need self-expression and freedom of thought also as a human right. We hear from businesses that they think strong journalism is important. We hear from technology platforms that they want to support journalism. And we hear from governments, some of them at least, that a free press is critical to the functioning of democracy. So it's time for all of those stakeholders to make the right constitutive choices. I think some more good news is that we can actually take our cue from things which are already happening. And again, I'm very proud that a lot of this is happening from coming from young journalists with a great deal of energy changing things on the ground. The one strong area of growth in journalism is in independent non-profit news. Ventures like ProPublica, the Texas Tribune, and sim single topic reporting organizations in the states like the Marshall Project for Criminal Justice, Chalkbeat for, private ed for Public Education, have not only set up shop, but they've delivered some of the best journalism, both in their region and subject area and in the world. And these efforts are expanding, whilst commercial endeavors are merging and shrinking. A survey of independent nonprofit news members last week demonstrated the big foundations that used to be the main source of support are now less than 50%, and individual donations is making up the gap. Journalists are innovating in collaborations too. Organizations like the ICIJ, the OCCRP, the International Fact Checking Network, they're all new types of network that share skills, uh, and in doing so, they set new standards. People recognize we're in a crisis and we need good journalism. So subscription revenues to organizations are for the first time beginning to show real, really that they can work in digital as our membership models. But these are a real drop in the bucket. The other thing I would say about um, membership models and subscription is that there's a great deal of jealousy among some news executives when uh, the president of the United States names their organization uh, as an enemy of the people or as fake news because generally speaking one of them told me they get like a 10,000 person spike in subscriptions so then there are the platforms and they've been largely forced to acknowledge that they have responsibilities in this area mainly by the looming threat of uh, regulation there are now journalism funds from Google and Facebook both of whom are spending a very small I think hundred million dollars each a year supporting journalism Facebook is going to pay publishers for news on its news tab. Google is starting six experimental local journalism projects in the US and Britain with local publishers. Both are spraying cash a very wide range of journalistic activities, rehabilitating their reputations as they go. You may be able to detect that I'm not completely unbiased in this issue. Uh, there's every reason to believe that these projects will be useful, but it's really hard to know exactly how we'll be able to assess them. Do we also really want a private company which is involved in as much civic infrastructure as Google, from provision of fiber, to putting Wi-Fi uh, into your local area, to putting self-driving self cars on the road? Do we want a company that's involved in those things also to be involved in building the local press? What if, as well as developing downtown Toronto with the Sidewalk Labs project, Google was also propping up the press that reported on the project's difficulties and shortcomings? When Facebook recently conducted a survey into local news, they found there was so little reporting in one area that there was nothing to survey. Shortly afterwards, Facebook announced it would be giving small grants to 23 local outlets, totaling $1.5 million in a new community journalism project. Causing the problem, diagnosing the problem, then fixing it for pocket change is something we don't allow in any other area of commercial activity, and we shouldn't allow it in this one. Yes to, yes to the involvement of the platform companies, and certainly yes to the involvement of their money. They're not going away. They're going to be uh, with us for the long term. But no to the arbitrary and opaque way that their involvement in this works at the moment. And for the first time in my memory, we're seeing government initiatives and policy suggestions that are beginning to understand that we need a civic media movement which will take back control from these large corporations. The Canadian government's been prescient in this area with a $600 million support budget for journalism or media bailout funds, depending on which newspaper you read. Uh, 
there are many things, I think, that are wrong with this scheme. But it's a starting point, not a destination. And I would hope other countries find a way to emulate that kind of policy energy. For the first time in the 2020 US election primaries, there are a number of candidates outlining support plans for journalism. Bernie Sanders would stop media consolidation, support community-owned journalism, which includes taxing targeted advertising platforms to pay for these initiatives. Elizabeth Warren similarly wants to see the antitrust regulation of platforms and regulation improved on private, imposed on private equity. In the UK, a major review of journalism in peril, the Cairncross Review, res resulted in an idea to establish a new body that would have its sole focus the development of public service journalism outside the usual channels of the BBC. I think all of these signs are incredibly encouraging and they give me a lot of hope for the future. But they're not, at the moment, enough. We need to think in a more long-term manner and try, if we can, to build the kind of infrastructure and institutions we need to sustain civic media for the next 50 years, in the same way that public media served its audiences for 50 years. We need a civic media manifesto which helps support networks of journalists who are focused on mission-driven work. At the heart of this needs to be the rights of citizens to be represented by their media, to have the right to hear important and useful things that make their lives better. Citizens also have a right to know how their inform information environment works, to know what is happening to their data, to understand who is in control and what, of, of what they are seeing and hearing. If we start with these civics rights, then we should be able to build systems, institutions and regulation and funding mechanisms that support them. Don't we have this already? Isn't this what public media does? No, I don't think so. Not in the form it needs to take. It does exist in many places. Thank you, CBC. Uh, but if it's going to take on the challenge at the heart of a new type of civic media project, these institutions are going to have to adapt a great deal more. Public media needs to be able to help other public service media organisations thrive too. As more of the journalism market disappears completely, becomes dependent on the technology platforms, or migrates into the non-profit sector, there'll be a need that centres the power of the network. And public media is ideally placed for this. Public media organisations should have it as their mission to help institutions with similar standards and values. Services like technology, tool building, legal support, research. These should be networked resources built for public media and put in service of journalism. If there are to be incentives and subsidies for journalism, they should be used to encourage new types of behaviour and standards. And yes, I do think that the profits of technology companies should be paying for all of this but they should not be controlling it. Transparency about financing, transparency about the publishing process and corrections, use of ethical software and data practice, and the training and diversity of staff are all obvious ways that we can help a better transformation. And people need to be encouraged to participate in media. I know it sounds exhausting whenever I say to my mum, you should get involved, she's 86, she's like, no, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to switch on the radio and listen to it. But we do want people to see themselves represented in reporting organisations, connecting with each other in real spaces as well as online. It's so encouraging to see some experimental partnerships between libraries that have also had a similar crisis in mission and newsrooms as one emerging model for how we can create new civic spaces for people to explore the information and data around them. Our leading organisations, private and public institutions, our politicians have, I think, to make this happen. A civic media manifesto should be ambitious and imaginative and radical. Isn't it interesting, I sometimes think, that for all the talk we hear from people who held themselves up as innovators, from the people who founded some of the biggest companies of the world in Silicon Valley, they have spent billions and billions of dollars on encouraging people to click on one more ad, but they haven't managed how to work out how to make original reporting sustainable. More than once in the past few years, I've thought, because journalists like to think in uh, metaphors um, or similes, I can't remember which, both. Um, more than once in the past few years, I've thought about the striking similarities between the crisis in our climate and the crisis in our news environment. Although the scale and consequences of both are completely different, they are, I think, related. 
Both have been caused by profit placed as a higher priority, priority than civic well-being. The urgency of commerce has trumped everything else, even when we had the warning signs right in front of us. Like climate change, we're not looking, I think, at a quick fix for our journalism. We need a long-term program which takes in education and research as well as technology and reporting and editing. A civic media manifesto recognises that there is no end in sight, that the age of misinformation and information warfare is not a temporary state, but it is the new normal. And like climate change, I suggest we can't afford to wait. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was very gloomy. We're going we're gonna to take questions uh, from the audience now, your chance to be on ideas, more importantly, your chance to talk to Emily Bell. So I'm going to go sit with Emily. I ran for public office seven times thus far. My name's on the ballot here in this federal election. Um, you mentioned Google and all its money. Yep. In 2004, their general counsel, still is, David Drummond, when they did their IPO, he got caught with his fingers in the cookie jar. I'm a whistleblower about financial crimes. I caused hearings at the Senate Banking Committee in Washington before I ran for parliament. Elliot Spitzer testified on my behalf. That said, I sent Mr. Drummond an email and the SEC, and his troubles went away. I send Mr. Drummond emails sometimes on a daily basis. Now, I've lived the digital world. Back when I was first on the internet in the 90s, we used to call Microsoft the evil empire. I loved Google, or Yahoo, rather. I'm going to have Geos to ask for a question. I'm sorry. Just going to have to ask. All right. I have documents here for you. You can study. Nobody believes me. Google Fundy Royal, CBC or ask Philip Lee why he's ignored the documents I gave him since 2004. My letter to Philip Lee is here. Here's a letter from Frontline saying my story was too big to tell in 2004. You're welcome to the documents or any ethical journalist. I'd like a student to have them. Thank you. If you're offered documents, you should take them, students. Um, even if you're a little worried that you may not get anything out of them, that's, a, that's serious. Um, I do know that people have not looked at documents. I would say, and it's not judging the documents that you have, I think there are, there are some really good journalists looking at these stories right now. You should send them to Julia Angwin at The Markup, who has, who set up, who set up a, a, a journalism startup specifically to look at exactly those stories. So. Um, I'm not trying to, to stop you, but I... Uh, no, well... Listen, nobody would be happier if the stories about Google were true than me. So, so, if, uh, so I would say, I would say there are a lot... There are... I know, I know who David Drummond is, for sure, and he's in... No, 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 I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying, you know, there are good reporters, who, and there are stories that are overlooked for years that then happen, so. Okay, you've made your point. And, and, and look, I'm gonna ask for your question. And no statements, but just a question, thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a first year law student and uh, I studied English and philosophy in undergrad and I have a very just practical question, if you have any effective writing advice. Writing advice? Yes. Um, okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> I do have some practical writing advice. Uh, in fact, I was discussing this on Twitter this afternoon when I should have been writing. That's the other thing. Is don't, don't delete Twitter would be my first advice for writers. Okay. Um, my second piece of advice, uh, advice is just write a lot all the time. Uh, my third piece of advice is, of course, just read and read and read and read, because if you can't read, you're not going to be a good writer, or if you don't read, you're not going to be a good writer. But 
if you're talking about journalistic writing, I would say the most important thing is reporting. I have seen some of the worst copy of my life come from some of the best reporters. And sometimes actually pulling stories out of people is a completely different skill from synthesizing them into beautiful prose. And let me tell you this, you can always, as they say, fix the writing in post, but you can't fix the reporting in post. So I would say for writing, read and write every day. It's like, it's like going to the gym, which I don't do very much of, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it, it's like a muscle memory. You have to do it over and over and over and over and over again. And good journalistic writing often just comes from that experiential that experiential thing. And uh, the, thank you, Google and Facebook. Anyone can write every day and publish it to the world now. So I would also start doing that. I was, for throughout my four years, I think there's been a lot of like, like making sure people are sticking well with their morals and their ethics and they're really good with saying no and like they, they try not to compromise that. I was wondering if there was a time where you had were faced with that and <gasps> where I compromised my ethics. Yeah, like if you were, well, wow. if you were faced with like compromising oh, your. That's a big. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> I'm a bit worried because we do. We have serious journalists in the audience. I don't think I should. But not, like, not even like if you came at that crossroads. Yes. And how like well, you handled what, actually, it? I tell you what, actually, quite seriously, I was a business journalist mm. in the '90s, and. Now, when I think back about the things that we would do in British journalism or take without really necessarily thinking about it, mm. um, I'm actually quite shocked. I sort of, I, and, and I'm not necessarily putting myself, I was always, I never got the really good freebies, I would say that. I was like, um, uh, but, but, but I was aware that they were around. Mm. And I do think that, like, just going back to what I said in the talk, I think that, um, it's really hard when you are a young journalist, and particularly when you're not on a high salary, mm. to resist the tides of, you know, wristbands to the Spotify party, um, kind of hanging out, uh, going to lunch at kind of smart places. All of that will be offered to you, and it's incredibly tempting to take it. I would say don't. Yeah. And I would say that those things you know, are still around. Um, I'll tell you a story, you know, an academic that I know. Um, Just one, one second oh, before you start. Jesse, I'm hearing a, a knocking sound. Is that something to be concerned about? Okay, I'm hearing it, but okay, keep going. So yeah. I just got, I got to like an ethical story that I was going to blow the oh, lid sorry. on and then you stopped me. That's no, okay. <laughs> That's, so, uh, so, so an academic um, told me uh, recently that they had, they had been approached by a large tech company um, because they work in one of the areas I was talking about, algorithmic accountability. Um, and there are lots of people now working in that area, and they're all investigating tech power. Uh, and the large technology company had given them a grant with no strings attached just to think about the work that they were doing. And I said, well, how was that? And he said, I wish I hadn't taken it, because, of course, it's just to support my work. But I began to think, why are they doing this to me? And then... Two years later, he said there were calls came inevitably from the big tech firm. Could you maybe just come and speak at our conference, etc.? It's one of the reasons I'm really worried about the kind of the involvement of Facebook and Google in journalism at the moment. I think if we have to take the money to support it, then that's fine. But I think the fact there's no transparency is re really dubious. Mm. So yeah, in the, in the 90s, basically every day was an ethical challenge. <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's really encouraging that actually now ethical lines are much more clearly drawn. And the other thing is this: that it used to be the case that nobody knew if you were at the smart parties or hanging out with the wrong people, who politicians, etc. Nowadays, thanks to social media, everybody knows. Everybody knows. Everybody is reporting on you just as you're reporting on them. And that is an extremely strong incentive to, as the great Patty Smith says, do good work and keep your name clean. Mm. Those are the two things that you need to do. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is David Brown. And I was fascinated by your, your uh, presentation. And um, I'm curious, we obviously understand why we need a, a civic media manifesto. Um, uh, are you proposing to write it? <laughs> and then the question, I think, 
well, for me anyway, um, given the proliferation of the digital and the social media um, and the business problem, you know, business model problems that are fake news, um, I was thinking, it's as a semi-retired recovering high school teacher, um, the civics aspect of our education system, would this, would your manifesto be included instead of the civic media manifesto, would it not be possible to change the name slightly to give it a little twist to the civics media? And the idea of our, our media education is not been part of our overt or hidden curriculum. It's just, this is the way it is. So yeah, I th no, if you I th see where my question yeah, is I think, no, I think that's going. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank and you. so would I write it? No. Okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm very, well, I'm very happy to contribute ideas to it. And uh, actually, myself and Taylor Rowan, who gave this lecture a couple of years ago, we're writing a book at the moment which focuses on some of these. And who knows, we may produce something that even looks a bit like a manifesto out of it. Um, but the point that you make is absolutely right, which is I think that I, I don't think people have quite got their heads round, and it's it's not surprising because this is my full time job, and I've barely got my head around it. Mm -hmm. Just how much this is going to change the world, you know, that everything with a data feed coming off it, everything is media. Everything can be turned into stories, information, advertisements. Um, I uh, was at a slightly horrifying seminar um, with advertisers, uh, influencers, um, academics, uh, publishers and journalists uh, at Harvard Business School a couple of years ago. Uh, and somebody there said, who's an advertising agency, and said it quite seriously, in the future, every single free piece of content that we see will probably be overwritten or underwritten by a commercial message. And everything that you want to be free of commercial messages, you will have to pay for. And I, it was like everybody in the room sat back and went, wow, surely that can't be the case. But, you know, kind of, it, I mean, unless we, unless we do start making some of those rules and adopting some of those principles right now, that, that's the direction we're heading in. You know, um, so media education in schools used to be about, you know, do you know how to read the newspaper? Do you understand why the news is telling you that? Do you understand, you know? Now it's like much more complicated. Now it really is about, I mean, one of the things I get my students to do is buy ads on Facebook, which seems a, bit, <laughs> seems a bit strange given my position on all of this. But until you buy an ad on Facebook, you don't really realize how much, um, how they allow you to target, um, how they get you to change, you know, that you can turn anything into an ad. You can turn, you know, an article that somebody else has written into an ad. I could take something that one of you guys has written in one of your classes, I could turn it into an ad on Facebook and I could send it to a million people um, saying, kind of, you know, come to my journalism course because it's much better than your journalism course. There's nothing to stop me doing that. It's, it's, it's there already. So I think that we are going to have to put this into the curriculum oh, yeah. because it's, it's, it's about technology, it's about information of all sorts. You think fake news is bad in politics, healthcare, finance, you know, it, it's, it, all of this is going to be a problem. It's, and, and I think unless we really understand that and educate people about the systems that deliver it, about why um, and, and how these can be manipulated, or even just how they work, um, it's not a simple, it's no longer a simple exercise, it's a complicated exercise. So yes, you should write that curriculum. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't like the idea of writing a curriculum either, do you? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Jonathan. I'm a first year law student from down the hill. Um, and uh, yeah, I was raised as a CBC kid, so I love the CBC. But how do you feel about uh, crown corporations uh, that are uh, reporting on politics and their responsibility to Canadians versus uh, the responsibilities of private corporations? Sorry, now you'll have to explain the concept of a crown corporation to me because we don't have those oh, in the UK it's, or indeed, it's, I think. If, it's just a, a corporation that's sort of funded by our federal government. And right. Yeah. Got it. So. Well, so, so there's a, I mean, so, so every time I say to people, because I'm, I'm, you're a CBC kid, I'm a BBC kid, um, every time I say, you know, we need more federal involvement and funding for journalism, 
it, it creates a reaction which says we don't what the one thing we don't want is more state media and like in all of these places where there's a problem with the press you know state media is absolutely the worst i mean i take a slightly different view which is state media is horrible in countries where freedom of the press is horrible and it does not matter if it is state funded or commercial it is all captured there's so so in countries with functioning democracies i think the discipline of saying we can create funding mechanisms that don't um, influence the reporting is a challenge, but I think it's kind of something that actually does work in certain environments, works in lots of places in Europe. Um, it works or has worked in the past at the BBC. And I think there's one thing about it which is really healthy, which is not actually part of like how reporters do their jobs, which is when you have um, public media funding or a public media policy, it gets a lot of discussion. Like, people really care and feel angry about the BBC um, and love things it does not hate, hate certain other things it does. Same is true of CBC. I think that having that, you know, having, having a policy and having funding um, available is not necessarily intrinsically bad. And I know that lots and lots of American journalists in particular really disagree with me on that. They think it is literally the worst thing that could happen. I, I kind of look at what's happening to journalism in America and say, kind of the worst thing that could happen is, is pretty much has pretty much happened now. So how much worse do you expect it to get? Um, so, 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 so sorry, that's a slightly elliptical way. So, so in other words, it depends on the journalism, right? There's good journalism, there's bad journalism. There are journalists who genuinely are focused on, am I going to tell people things that they need to know? And journalists who are focused on the gotcha and the sensationalist and the what have you, you know, which it, which does create lots of attention, but sometimes it doesn't always serve a purpose. That you know, good and bad journalism exists under all business models. So part of it is really about you know, kind of what what's the editorial leadership like, you know, how are your journalists trained. Um, I think that all of those are sort of more important in a way than and, and and the most important thing is it's transparent that at least ownership and funding is transparent and then you can make your own mind up about whether or not something has been influenced one way or another sorry is that if i avoided the question completely no see, i'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that thank you I did, <laughs> see i did a law degree too so lawyers are very good at kind of like arguing without actually answering the question there's a lot of pressure nowadays to get stories out quickly and I know people who have graduated and work at news organizations by themselves on the weekend where they're expected to pump out, you know, three to four stories in their eight hour workday. And that really worries me as a future journalist who's hopefully going to work at a news organization next year, maybe. <laughs> so I'm wondering what your advice is on how to stick up for yourself in in a demanding, quick turnover rate job, and as if we, as young journalists, should value quality over quantity. So, as the person who helped invent live blogging, all I can say is I'm really sorry because we did that to ourselves. Um, it's a great question because there is that sort of the pressure. Um, I was reading only today that uh, I think is it Forbes magazine um, has a contractual agreement with journalists that they get paid um, I think $300 flat rate if they do five pieces a week and they get more if they do seven a week and it's incentivizing the wrong things it drives me it sort of drives me nuts because it is really incentivizing the wrong things um, Having said that, you know, in the olden days, um, the editor of The Guardian apparently used to come into work at about 11 in the morning, um, would have a very long lunch with some of it, their friends. In, well, this is not Alan Rusbridge, this is like, this is like, this is like a long time ago. <laughs> um, would have, you know, lunch with their friends and, and come back and read the sort of 20 page newspaper uh, and then be able to go out to dinner by sort of seven o'clock. So, so, you know, there was a point when we had very, very few stories. Um, and you would have to write one or two a week, and now it's, as you say, sort of four or five on a shift. I mean, the advice to, for standing up for yourselves, and I apologise to anyone who's a media owner in the room, join a union. Really important, I think, that um, you know journalists are uh, in exactly the same position in the gig economy as everybody else, and unless you unionise and organise, then um, it's very difficult to stand up just for yourself. But, you know, join a unionised workplace, join a union. Uh, and the second thing is just kind of, you know, beat the drum for quality. 
Uh, and I think that you know everybody knows that if you're doing five quick takes on something that's happening that's live, that might be what you need to do. I mean, the other thing is that, like, you know, there's no way of varnishing this. If you're a political reporter who's been working on the Hill in Washington this week or in Westminster in, um, in the UK, you will be working all the time. You'll be, you will be, you know, you will never be switching off. And I know people who've worked on big stories, you know, the team that worked on the Snowden leaks at The Guardian, um, people who've worked on, you know, huge kind of like global exclusives like the Panama Papers. People don't, you, you know, you have to be, you have, so, so on the one side of it, I would say, stand up for quality, stand up for yourself. On the other side, be really clear that when you're a journalist, it's entering a profession that is not, to quote my beloved former deputy of the Guardian, like working in a shoe shop. Um, so, you know, that the, 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 there, there are going to be times when it, it kicks your ass and when you are going to have to. But knowing when that's important to do that and work and work like that and knowing when it's actually undermining you and undermining the work you do is really important. So, you know, it's, it's difficult. I really feel for young journalists and indeed older journalists who are put under that kind of pressure. Um, I'm hopeful that actually the business model for that is pretty broken. So that's exactly the kind of churning out stuff which is not earning advertising dollars anymore. Um, and the things that people will pay for are more deeply reported, sort of, you know, so, so, so hopefully this is something that will solve itself. Um, but there's still an awful lot of it around. And, you know, kind of it's difficult in an environment when you may feel that you have to do well in every single job or you may not work again. Um, but you, there is nothing worse than low-quality work appearing under your byline. My question is, um, is uh, democracy going to survive? You know, there's so much, too much doubt being sown in... Yeah. <laughs> Too much doubt being yeah. sown into people's minds right. in, in, in New Brunswick here, you know. Some people I think are absolutely normal people. They come and, and tell me some outlandish kind of theories and say, how do you get that? How, how, how can you believe that kind of stuff? And it continues, it continues, yeah. the big onslaught on everybody. We have her grandchild, and that grandchild, one and a half years old, she could open a, a, a cell phone and, and, and find what she wanted. And now, when she was four years old, you know, she wanted to have the, 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 the thing, and she would go into the corner, and I realized that there is YouTube, it's that full of advertising aimed at children. You know, everybody's mind is just filled with doubt in sales uh, information. So uh, is, is, is our democracy think, going to survive? Well, oh, so is democracy going to survive is a difficult question. Um, but, and I'm not being flippant about it. I think that, well, well one thing I would say, which uh, I hear um, and see a lot, and we see it in discussing freedom of the press, is that I think we in rooms like this and in my classroom in New York and at The Guardian when I um, visit there, we think or we assume that the model of Western democracy is, is, the, is the rising model. It is the model which is actually sort of going to eventually um, be the model that is adopted by everybody, and that's not true. Uh, it's actually in recession. Um, and there are really worrying, uh, I think, developments on that front. And when democracies flip, they flip really, really quickly. So when you see what's happening in Hungary with the press there and Orban, when you see what's happening in the battle for Ukraine uh, and whether or not they adopt a, a democratic model, whether they're pushed into um, autocracy by uh, their Russian neighbours, when you see that China has said, look at America, democracy looks terrible, we, should just, we, sh we shouldn't do so much of that. Look at, that, look at how well capitalism, look at how well state capitalism functions. That, that I think that that rhetoric, um, and this is something where again, you know, just sort of the, 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 that you know, journalism and the free press is so vital in that 
argument. How do we sort that out? How do we make sure that people understand that? And how do we get them really to sort of enough information so that they can be self-determining and, and self-governing is, is a critical question. And I do worry that, um, I think it was George Soros that said, you know, that, that the combination of um, sort of Western uh, technology with uh, authoritarianism is an absolutely terrifying trend. That, you know, these free systems are in fact enormous surveillance systems. Uh, and they can be used in extremely worrying ways against populations. I think that's why we, you know, journalists, we just need to report, report, report. This is a huge story. This is the story of our time. Uh, and we haven't been very well equipped to report it, I think, until now. I think now the penny is dropping. I can't answer the question. I mean, I really, you know, think that democracy has to survive. And I do believe in human... I believe that people want to determine what happens to them. That's way better than the alternative. But there are challenges, and the information environment is, is one of those challenges, for sure. And that's why I think we need to make the rules and we need to make the commitment now, rather than waiting until it's too late. Okay. My name is uh, Jasmine Gindy, and I'm the features editor of The Quinian. Um, <laughs> journalism is a very stressful job. Um, how do you handle this stress? Well, I stopped being a journalist. Well, no, I'm I, 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 it's a great question. Um, I still do journalism. I just do the really nice sort where people ask you to write things and you do it, rather than the really stressful sort, which is going in every day. Um, I mean... It's, I, I don't wish, I don't, again, I don't wish, uh, journalism is not for everybody. I have to be really clear about this. Journalism, we, we do a talk with, for our new students, um, and just in the past few years, we've had to talk about things like hostile environments and uh, self-protection, and some of the students have found it a bit much. Uh, and our dean, Steve Cole, who's a great um, multiple Pulitzer-winning investigative journalist, uh, does a very good talk where he says there are things you are going to have to do as a journalist which are very stressful and if you if you feel that you can't do them we will give you your money back because it's not fair to put yourself through that the stress I think of daily work is 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 more about really understanding how, like when to, you cut the, the worst thing now is that journalism there's no boundary between your home life and your work life but there never has been journalists have never really had a switch off zone um when i when i was you know kind of starting out in the profession the most horrifying thing to me was the obituaries page of the press gazette because like i'm 54 now and like everybody was dead by the time they were 54 and it was the smoking and the drinking <laughs> and the stress you know, the smoking and the drinking and the stress, just like journalists just didn't live very long. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm not making this up. That this is, it's absolutely the case that it was... Can't for a holiday. No, and you can't afford, you can't afford to go on holiday. It's a, and, and, and even when you can, there are people just don't want to go on holiday because what if they leave the newsroom and news happens? <laughs> um, which is a huge disaster for journalists on holiday when news happens are the worst people to be with. My husband, until like two weeks ago, was a journalist for 30 years. I was a journalist, you know, I'm still a journalist. It's just like some bad people, journalists, journalists are terrible people to be with when news is happening. They're awful. Um, <laughs> I, I actually think, but the serious answer to your question, I think, is this. I think that employers are going to have to come up with better ways of rotating people between the breaking and the non-breaking, the very stressful and the less stressful. I think if you don't like a stressful job, please don't be a journalist, because it's very, very stressful. Um, I think if, but there are other jobs which are much more stressful. I think, you know, kind of, uh, there, are, there are many jobs that are more stressful than being a journalist. But I do think that thinking about self-care is very important. Switching off is very important. G putting the phone in a drawer, I have to basically lock my phone away to stop me looking at it. Delete Twitter. That's very important. Delete Twitter. It's like, that's, that's one thing. Um, and then just completely sort of getting yourself away from it is not actually just about self-care. It's also about perspective. I think one of the things that I worry about as well in this kind of like very, very sort of like the hot house that we're in now is it's very, you have to keep a clear head. Uh, and it's hard to do with all of the sort of the incoming um, so, you know, kind of like, I think that sort of you need to make time for yourself, you need to keep, you need to have 
strict hours where you will switch your phone off and not look at it, and news will happen in those hours, and then you'll hate yourself. It's very important that you very important that you get. But but you also have to you also have to think about how you can be resilient when things are stressful. Um, and you know, I was on the desk uh, on 9/11 which was kind of like where we basically, for the next three years, I never went home because we're also web, our web traffic went up by fivefold. We were the only way that a lot of people could actually get information. I think the Guardian website grew faster than any other website in the United States during that time, apart from Fox News. <laughs> Whoops. Um, <laughs> And, and we were on non-stop. We had to go, I had to go in every, you know, I was meant to be the editor-in-chief, sort of had a fancy title, not a very fancy job. You know, you're going in every weekend and seeing, um, you know, pretty horrible images coming in, the sort of the raw feeds from uh, war zones. You had uh, lots and lots and lots of kind of, you know, incoming in through email death threats. I used to get sort of 600 death threats a day at one point when we'd said something very unpleasant um, that we possibly shouldn't have done about America. Uh, and, and, and all of that is, it, it was much easier when you had a big institution around you to take that off your plate. So I think that that's, make a network, that's my, other, that's my other piece of advice. One of the great things about being at a college like this, in a journalism program like this, is it's your network. One of the things that I think gives me most joy about seeing journalists leaving Columbia is that, they've, that they have a network. Um, and they look after each other, and they look out for each other, and I think that's totally important that this is kind of something where, you know, your peers will understand. So, you know, kind of when you, it's not just, it's like what you're getting here is not just an education, it's a network of support. Use that network. Do you think that this growing sort of trend of all these very specific journalism sites and organizations, do you think that's always a good thing or can that be really overwhelming to the public in a sense? Or can that be just information overload for a lot of people? I think information overload is one of those things that's very easy to complain about from a position of privilege. So I hear people talking all the time about how they're overwhelmed with, oh, there's too much to read. There's too much good journalism out there. Um, we should be so lucky. Um, so yes, I think there's a problem in, um, I think there is genuinely a problem in oversupply in certain areas of the market. And one of my things that I worry about is that um, when the economic cycle takes a downturn, which it will at some point, uh, I just think that a lot of those organisations will um, cease to exist. Uh, so I think sort of enjoy the wide variety and the overload now because I don't think that's going to be our problem in a couple of years' time. Uh, I think sort of more generally the idea of sort of niche sites, is that, I don't know whether that's what you're talking about, or single subject sites, or very specific sort of really narrow niches, is, is, is a really interesting one. It's kind of like a develop, and for journalism students, it's another, um, I think, uh, way the world is going, which is really being able to do one thing incredibly well is still um, hugely valuable in most newsrooms. So if you are the data guy and you, re you are really good at data stories, or if you know more than anybody else about politics in the province, you know, it's like it just, it's, it's specialization. Um, is something which is actually, I think, changing the field. And part of me feels sad about that. One of the great joys of being a general assignment reporter is you get to do a bit of everything. Um, I think that that is kind of going away to a certain extent, maybe not the big places, but certainly I think sort of in, in the field in, in general, it's going away. Is it a problem? I think if there's a market to support it, it's not a problem. Um, I don't think we have too much good information. I think we have a problem finding too much good information. You know, I think we have a problem finding that information. So I think we have a, we have a filter problem rather than a supply problem. I actually have two questions. Um, That's the great. Same, yeah. So the first one is a, li a, bit of, a, li a, bit of, sorry, a little bit more elaborate. Um, so you've mentioned a civic manifesto, a civic media manifesto. Um, so how would that manifesto uh, beat written, taking into consideration countries where freedom of expression um, or transparency doesn't exist, not necessarily because of corporations, but the government? Well, so I think that it, this is not going to be solved just by government. It, you know, this has to be civil society organizations, it has to be journalism organizations. You know, I talked a little bit about collaboration between uh, journalism organizations. You know, one of the really sort of impressive things about 
organizations like the ICIJ, the um, International Consortium for Investigative Journalism, which um, broke the Panama Papers is, they are a collective of many, many, many different news organizations around the world, but they have a kind of a set standard uh, and, um, you know, they have kind of, not just anybody uh, is allowed <laughs> to work within that network. They are careful about how they select their partners, that they have certain standards. Same is true of the International Fact Checking Network. You can establish standards. Public, me public media has, has like amazing standards, um, you know, kind of officers and codes. So some of this already exists out there about like how can, you know, how should all of these things be applied? But for instance, you know, the fact that there's no transparency requirement at all on Facebook or Google uh, or any of the other platforms to allow transparency into what, for instance, is happening on its news feed. You know, we have researchers who've been trying to get data out of those systems, and, you know, um, all of them have, got, even Twitter, which is relatively open, all of them have shut down access dramatically in the last four or five years. You know, things like that, I think, are not about, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't all have to be central government. You know, kind of founders in tech companies have superpowers because they can do things. Uh, which are not necessarily in the interest of their shareholders. So they could, if they really wanted to fix this, you know, I'm sick of hearing Google and Facebook saying, we want to fight misinformation. But some of the most basic things that they could do to fight misinformation, like really working out how to elevate original reporting that's correct <laughs> over stuff that isn't, they haven't done that work. You know, it's a, so, so there are lots, of, I think, of, of different ways that this will manifest itself. Um, how does it work in areas where you have governments that are closing down journalism and journalist societies? I do think international networks are really powerful, and I think that those are things where, you know, the, the CPJ is kind of overwhelmed um, because they have so many imperiled journalists in different parts of the world now. But you can see how those types of organisations are can help um, freedom of the press into, you know, there's an amazing kind of network now of knowledge sharing and, and, and exchange and skills. Um, there's an amazing network of people who help journalists that are in peril in different countries. You don't just have to rely on sort of, you know, one or two, uh, you know, publishers now to, 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 to be, to, be um, to help you do that. So I think this is, a, you know, it's about adopting and understanding what the values are. Um, and then applying them across a large number of organizations that are focused on this problem. Um, repressive regimes are not going to get, you know, they're, they're, they're only going to get worse in a way. Um, you know, they co-opt the technology. I mean, you know, if, again, if, if, if Google and Facebook are really on the side of journalism, then there will be certain things that they simply stop doing in those countries. You know, they would not have behaved in Myanmar in the way they did if they really cared about freedom of expression or understood it. I don't think they did it deliberately. I think they just didn't understand what they were doing. So, so I get what you're saying about, journal about, about certain um, regimes, but I think that this is, it's got to work in a very modern way, and that means it has to work really through different types of organisation. It can't just be a top-down, one institution solves everything. It has to be, you know kind of a horizontal movement, you know, rather than vertical movement. The second question is, how do you deal with very skilled PR people? <laughs> One of the very f skilled PR people I used to deal with was a man called David Cameron, who used to be the head of public relations for a television company in the UK. And then one day he became prime minister. Um, and... So I don't know why I told that. Just, I was just when you said um, very skilled PR people, I have an image of David Cameron patronising me over lunch uh, to tell me why I was wrong about certain things. Um, it's, it's actually pretty difficult because really skilled PR people are incredibly charming and they're very good at. Uh, they're very. I would say. I would say. Um, first of all, make sure that you make a note of everything. Uh, secondly, um, always go through the front door. So there's actually nothing wrong with dealing with really skilled PR people. Uh, you just have to be slightly more skilled journalist than they are a skilled PR person. 
But I would also say, you know, it's really important. That one of the most important things I have found is that if you're doing a big story, you have reporters on a big story. There's really no harm in ringing up, going through the front door and saying, hey, I'm working on this. Don't tell them exactly what the story is, but say, I'm interested in this area. Do you have anyone I could talk to? Um, because if you're a really good reporter, they will find it very, very hard to shut you down. You know, you're, you're much more at threat from things like, um, you know, kind of legal actions and what have you. But so, so I would say with skilled PR people, handle with care. Uh, but understand their motivations as well. Understand, if you can understand the way they want to move the story, uh, they can also give you access. And that's another ethical dilemma for journalists. But you know, if you're not, if it, you know, most most powerful people have pretty strong gatekeepers, uh, and getting through the gatekeepers is 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 you know working the refs is actually part of being a good journalist. So you know, I I, I in the past I sort of got to interview people like Rupert Murdoch, Conrad Black before he went to jail, um, and a whole ton of sort of you know me, media owners when I was in my twenties, and it was very, I shouldn't really have had access to those people, but it was just that persistent persistent drum banging and getting to know the get, getting to know the very skilled PR people as well and showing them that you were not going to give up that actually kind of the, 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 the you could produce really great stories with or without their help that's the other th thing to do if you produce great stories without their help nothing gets them to pick up the phone I just published a piece at the whenever it was last week um, and I had there's a PR there's a very skilled PR person at a large technology company, who was immediately on the phone. Haven't seen you for ages. Can we catch up? And it's like that's good reporting. It puts you in in charge. Thank you. Don't take any of their freebies either. That's the other thing. When I was in my twenties, because I'm a few years older than you, I also got Conrad Black just when he was doing the National Post, and I got Conrad Black through getting to know his secretary really really well. And I called her, and I called her, and I called her, and I called her, and got to know her. And she opened the door. His secretary. Just be nice to secretaries <laughs> all the time. That's it. such good advice. I had exact again. I had a big media company in the UK, and I managed to get. I was the only journalist who got the chief executive on the phone on a Friday night at eleven thirty only because every time I rang his office, I would spend 10 minutes chatting to his secretary. And I did that for about three years. And then lo and behold, I, and I didn't do it, you know, it was just because I just thought, you know, it's like, you know, it should be like, can I put you on hold? And I go, yeah, I suppose, you know, then we'd have a chat. But be friendly and be nice. Don't get all attitude -y and put me through. It's like I guess it's called assistant now, but I don't think it was even be manipulative. I just got to know her get and know knew them. that she held yes. the keys to the... And they see everything. They also see everything. So when the dam bursts, like there have been a few really big scandals, um, again, people going to jail. When the dam bursts, those people know everything and take them to the bar and... Uh, <laughs> I have a question about paywalls. Uh, over the last uh, few years, we've seen the elite newspapers like the New York Times and the Global Mail erect pay paywalls. Uh, what's your view of them? Uh, paywalls, a good or a bad thing? Uh, so I was sort of, I, I, I had a reputation in sort of about 2005, 2006 for being extremely vocal about keeping journalism free. Um, and part of that was because we had looked at all the numbers at The Guardian about what putting a pay... Well, two things. One of which was that part of our mission is to get our type of journalism to the widest possible audience, and paywalls didn't help that. Um, things have changed a lot since then. Not least the fact that actually you can now be incredibly flexible with the technology and payment methods. So now I think they're actually a wholly good thing, whereas in the past I just found that they were an insult to most sort of user experience. They, they put people off. They were difficult to implement. They were really expensive to run. Um, I think you know we have to give the New York Times a ton of credit for working very hard to set up a system that was, you know, most people will read New York Times stories um, whether they have a subscription or not. And that idea that you could get a kind of a porous level 
Um, and if you were reading the stuff all the time and really kind of relying on it, then, you know, really kind of actually paying for it is not a bad idea. But I think that, you know, that the, 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 the transactional model um, is giving way a little bit to the membership model, which is this idea of I want to support your work, so I'm going to give you some money, but I don't necessarily want the faff of signing in every single day. You know, there's so many different, and, and I think the technology will just get better and better and better in that, in that area. And again, if platforms would actually just make it possible, for God's sake, to implement subscription systems at article level within social apps, it, come, it becomes a whole lot easier again. So I kind of, I think that, you know, kind of we, 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 we have to get, people have to pay because advertising is not going to pay. Um, but we also have to think about how much we keep free and how much people can consume. Because again, you know, it's no good if we have a shrunk cadre of journalists who are all earning a fortune because they happen to work for organisations where the paywalls really work and their audiences are rich and they can afford. Uh, we don't, that's not, you know, that is not a good, that's a great future for a really small number of journalists. It is not a great future for journalism. So I think that sort of we have to have a model which allows people who can't pay to have access, for high, access to high quality information as well. You know, and it's, the model in the past has been that the higher the quality of the information, the more you have to pay. That should not be the case. Um, but at the same time, we have to support the institutions that pay the reporters. So, you know, kind of, I think we can figure that one out, though. I, do, I think that it's very important that we kind of work on the technologies that enable that. How does The Guardian do it, then? Because it's... Well, it doesn't have... A, it does actually have lots of paywalls. Um, uh, it asks you those begging letters that you get at the bottom of, the, uh, the bottom of the articles are amazingly effective. Um, and it's really an interesting um, just what we call last touch attribution, which is the types of stories that people read before they then decide to give money. And I do think that people understand you're, you're lucky if you're the Guardian because you have an educated audience which is really thinking about a lot of these issues. So it understands the pressures that are on democratic institutions and these are people who are not rich but they are um, very civically minded and they and they and they give money so the the, the guardian has kind of transformed um, itself with that social contract but part of the social contract is you can get everything for free so you know you you do pay for a version of the app you can pay for you know kind of different sort of products but the social contract is if you pay us if you if you contribute to us this helps our type of journalism stay free for everybody. And I think that people are motivated by that. I do think that people are motivated by the idea that they want more good journalism uh, in the world than they do to actually sort of get something for the money that they are paying. I don't think it's transactional. I think it's much more kind of mission-driven and emotional. That's a good note to end on. Good note to end Hope. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>